It's easier, someone once said, to imagine the end of the world than it is the end of capitalism. But it's clear that we're weak in might. Systems of this complexity. Cultural systems. Economic systems. Machines of this complexity. Surely we can make a world that could first meet those needs I described that everyone should have, and then perhaps meet needs that people have only dreamed of, like the need for some autonomy and freedom. The need for that little space up there, the eye part, to expand a little bit. Just a little. Just a little. Just a little. Socialism that could engage with the yearnings and dreamings and Miles Davis music and aesthetic dimension radically incompatible with everyday life under capitalism. Hey, happy listeners, today is not a good day because it's part of 2020 and it's a shitty year. Here we are, ready to talk about Joe Biden, Cardi B, and which of those two might be the future for America and indeed the world. Whatever the outcome of our discussion with our special guest, Joshua Chitarella, artist, meme maker, Twitch streamer, and commentator on the online left, we can be sure of one thing. Cardi B won't be on the ballot this November. So Joshua, uh, you've been working with memes for, for some years now as an artist, and we could say you're, you're an actual meme maker, or however you prefer to say, memester or something. Um, you've got a considerable following on Instagram, and you've been forging ahead uh, as an artist on Twitch as a, a kind of streamer who talks about art, culture, and, and memes, um, using the platform long before COVID-19 kind of threw people onto the platform, you know, because other channels were, were close to them. Um, what are the main innovations you've seen uh, in the last few years in terms of net culture, but also um, in these last few months since COVID, and what, what are the big changes for you in terms of online tactics between the 2016 election when famously the alt-right apparently maybe helped Trump win and now in the 2020 US election? Yeah, yeah, it's been um, quite a transformation in the last few years. Uh, I guess by way of introduction, maybe I'll start off by, um, for people who are unfamiliar with my work, I started in the the art world, capital A art world, as part of the broadly post-internet generation. Sometimes that's a dirty word now. People don't always like it. Uh, but I've always had one foot, <clears throat> excuse me, I've always had one foot in the world of capital A art, the professional art sphere, and one foot in this world of the internet culture, online, memetics, what have you, virality. Uh, and so when 2016 rolled around, a lot of the discussion that I saw around these topics were, um, to my taste, in some way lacking. And I wanted to chime in with an analysis from someone who was very, you know, visually literate, who had made uh, memes before. I had run several uh, anonymous or pseudonymous uh, art projects and meme accounts. And um, my practice in the last few years has taken a pretty significant pivot into writing and researching about these spaces, uh, trying to offer some kind of clarity about them. And, you know, it's been interesting because there were a lot of predictions, a lot of models of what we might have expected 2020 to be. And there has just been so many unbelievable, uh, you know, planetary transformative events that, you know, where, where are we now? Uh, th there's really nothing that could have predicted quite you know, the, the bizarre circumstances that we're in, uh, especially considering that, I mean, obviously the virus and, and everything else is happening right now. Um, so I guess broadly conceiving of the memosphere in 2016 as compared to 2020, the way I would describe it is that in 2016, there was um, 
there was a group of people, there was maybe a demographic of young people, of very extremely online people, uh, meme makers, meme wizards, whatever you might want to call them, <laughs> um, that were, were just ready to be activated. And Trump was that catalytic agent. There were a lot of things that were really in the mix. I think, however, wh whoever the candidate might have been in 2016, let's say it was Jeb Bush or it was Rand Paul or whoever, there would have been some similar outpouring of uh, foregrounding social media in the national news event that is the primary election. But Trump is an, an, an especial, uh, especially um, unique case that this is amplified by like orders of magnitude. Um, but now, you know, you survey the 2020 memosphere, uh, the groups are kind of siloed off. The factions are more or less crystallized. You know what side people are on. Um, there's just simply not that catalytic agent that traces the political evolution of meme accounts and uh, as they move through new ideas, uh, reconsider their previous worldview and enter into new positions, they nudge and move their audiences along with them. Um, that simply does not seem to be happening or, or to any degree that it is happening. Maybe we could say that this is brokered by influencers who were in support of Bernie Sanders and have since decided to quote, settle for Biden. Uh, and, and then that is the, uh, the only real nudge that I'm observing in the social media space right now. Uh, on the whole, you know, I think, I think 2020 would have been a fascinating uh, social media landscape had Bernie clinched the nomination, but unfortunately we are in a much darker reality right now. And um, unfortunately it's, it's a little bit, it's a little bit, uh, I guess, disappointing. There seems to be some really momentous things happening in so the social media landscape just in general with deplatforming. I mean, out on the streets is a, an extremely specific and um, exciting historical moment, but the, the memes uh, seem to have taken a back seat, I guess. <laughs> I, would, I would agree with you. That's my long circuitous route to say that 2016 memosphere was more interesting than 2020. Okay, yeah, thanks for that. Um, yeah, the Biden Adam, memes yeah. are sad, aren't they? Oh like, my God, yeah. <laughs> Like, and that's not even like arguing whether or not you should or shouldn't vote for him, but they just seem so sad compared to, uh, you know, the last in the 2016 or and before it's yeah. Compared to the Bernie memes and stuff, it's a very, um, it's a quite a lack of imagination and like a reveal of some cowardice, I think. Um, and, and a deep, uh, feeling of being scared. I think a lot of them portray as well. Yeah, yeah. It re I mean, it really feels like a vote against, and it's hard to get. It's hard to get amped up to like vote for the lesser of two evils. I guess is the easy, easy way to describe it. Um, it Taylor Lorenz uh, had a, a really interesting one-liner about this when the Mike Bloomberg memes were being rolled out. And she brought up that, you know, people made all these memes for Bernie Sanders for free. You know, he didn't have to pay them. <laughs> and you know what? What's even weirder is that they donated to his campaign and then they knocked doors. You know, not only did they not get paid by the campaign, they actually paid it and did free labor for it. Uh, that, I mean, they really believed in the project. So it, to some degree in this fracturing media landscape, I think there is um, a degree of... Um, and of trust people have in that memes can't be astroturfed. And so that makes them by default in some way trustworthy while the mainstream media is pushing some agenda from some powerful interests or something. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I find it fascinating that, that, that there's this kind of very banal, uh, pragmatic decision to vote Biden and it seems to be, be all that the left can do. Um, then in the meme sphere, you have, you know, you still have uh, this kind of raging tankies um, talking about revolution, and there's, there's kind of a a big kind of support or following of, of Chinese communism. Um, or I don't know how big it is. It's probably fairly niche, but I mean, it's certainly present. I know Joshua, you followed it a bit. 
um, but just this kind of great distance. And, and then actually, you know, for all the kind of um, the aggression and the vibrancy of this kind of tanky element and also the anarchist element in me making for all those intentions, actually that's very kind of lame because it's, it's so far removed from what actually can be done, you know? Um, so I'm really seeing that like, the only, the only thing that's I found really kind of incisive on online um, and I don't know if you can really call it online as such, but uh, I suppose I suppose a lot of it's been kind of viewed or listened to online. In the last couple of weeks, the thing I found most incisive is Cardi B and and Ben Shapiro's response to her. Uh, but just looking into <laughs> Cardi Cardi B and and and, uh, and and who she is and what she does, because I wasn't really it wasn't. On, I mean, obviously I'd seen her, but was, she wasn't on my radar particularly, as I'm not much of a rap follower. Um, but uh, she's just this very kind of uh, incisive force. Um, anyway, I want to I want to play firstly uh, Ben Shapiro and his response to Cardi B's song um, with her collaborator. What's her name? The Megan the Stallion. Megan the Stallion. Yeah. Um, I want to play uh, Ben Shapiro's response. If you'll just bear with me. Um, and he had a lot of flack for this on Twitter. So here we go. Whores in this house. There's some whores in this house. There's some whores in this house. There's some whores in this house. Hold up. Because I used to suppose he's reading the lyrics. Freak, seven days a week. Wet ass P word. Make that pullout game weak. Yeah, you effing with some wet ass P word. P word is female genitalia. Bring a bucket and a mop for this wet ass P word. Give me everything you got for this wet ass P word. Beat it up, N-word. Catch a charge. Extra large and extra hard. Put this P-word right in your face. Swipe your nose like a credit card. Hop on top, I want to ride. I do a kegel while it's inside. Spit in my mouth, look in my eyes. This P-word is wet. Come take a dive. It continues uh, along these lines. Uh, and it gets significantly, significantly more vulgar. Like, a, a lot more vulgar. Talk your S-word, bite your lip. Ask for a call while you ride that D-word. You really ain't never going to F him for a thing. He already made his mind up before he came. Now get your boots and your coat for this wet ass P word. Pay my tuition just to kiss me on this wet ass P. Right. So this is, do you, guys, this, this is what feminists fought for. This is what the feminist movement was all about. It's not, uh, it, it's not really about, you know, women being treated as independent, full, rounded human beings. It's about wet ass P word. And if you say anything differently, it's because you're a misogynist, you see. Okay, so that was uh, oh, Shapiro's so take. So what's <laughs> partly really incredible there is the way that he's, he's um, wanting to avoid the P word. Um, I, don't, I don't even want to say it myself, so this is gonna like, it's not going to work, but okay, pussy. His kind of refusal to say, say the words um, is, is what kind of makes it vulgar in a way. That there's not much I see vulgar in in Cardi B just expressing perhaps how she would like to behave uh, sexually, but the way he's just so kind of horrified by you know these human parts is what is really kind of vulgar. I, I think. Yeah, I mean, this has really been. Um, I have to I have to wonder about this just strategically. So so obviously you know as a an uh, orthodox conservative, whatever he's, um, you know, he he he's very uptight about these things for sure. Um, but I have to imagine that it's kind of running on two levels here, where to some degree he wants to decry the, you know, perverse like open sexuality, whatever. But he also he's got to know that this is going to go viral, and he's performing it and then people are going to set it to the music and it's really kind of bizarre. It's, I guess this is the the marvel of postmodern conservatism that it works on these two like a lower level and an upper level. It's like a two channel video where there's there's the intended meaning which is this this med message that you should be sexually repressed and then there's this the second meaning which is that we know this is going to float on top of the algorithm on social media because this is a trending topic and once we uh, tap into it, you know, pe people are going to see this and like he's saying it by not saying it. It's, it's this very complex, bundled up, nested uh, bunch of questions that are hard to uh, unravel here. 
Yeah, you know, it, it's listening to him read those lyrics never gets old. It's hilarious. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's obvious that he, he has to know. And then especially uh, his defense of it when he came out and he's like, my, my gynecologist wife, um, you know, basically <laughs> implying that she doesn't get aroused. Like, I don't know, the way he worded it, it's like there's obviously so much better ways he could say his point and it does it's i mean he's the gift that keeps on giving this meme and the stuff around it about shapiro's repression in that sense but you know it kind of reminds me of the uh the takashi 69 song um when he came back the the goomba and you know it has its hatred built into it in in a way it's like a song built to be memed and to be spread mm -hmm. around because you hate it. Um, and he even ask you, he's like, are you, are you dumb? Are you stupid? Or are you dumb? Um, you know, you're the <laughs> ones talking about this. Uh, and then like, and then we saw Belle Delphine um, come back after some time off and like weird speculations, of course, that she was dead or something like that. And did a parody of that Takashi 69 song. Um, and her whole career, in a way, is, of course, built on sexualization, but then a hatred of it. Like, she's inviting people to troll her and also trolling them back. Um, you know, like, there's not many... She comes out in that in her back song and tells the people that she's trolling the betas, like, using the internet culture against <laughs> itself. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. They, they do seem related in a way. I think... Um, Shapiro maybe is not quite as aware of it, but it does seem like he's aware of it on some level. Uh, so is that the thing that we're seeing, like the intentional um, trying to be trolled, trying to be turned into a negative meme? Yeah, it's it's funny. It's I mean, this is kind of something that happens with every aspect of internet culture, that it is both simultaneously earnest or sincere, but also joking and ironic. And I guess the wager is that people are going to look at your video, they're going to laugh at you because you sound very silly, you sound very uptight. But then for a, a slimmer margin of people that see this, they're going to be like, yeah, you know what? They are putting nasty bedroom things on television. And it's getting to the point where even I have a problem with it. And it will make this implicit conservative position that they held maybe quietly or, or they weren't aware of it. It was this latent position. And now it becomes explicit. And, and who says what is to trigger uh, that, that emergence where they move between the, uh, uh, the, the, those two positions. But it does clarify something for somebody. Um, I guess that is the, that, that maybe that elucidates some of the strategy for it right that you can kind of participate in it but you're trying to build the the new um the, the new movement in in the shell of the old or or something like that right like ben shapiro has to participate in the fallen world to rebuild the you know uh conservative uh repressed utopia that he really wants to exist yeah, I mean, yeah. there's there's all of that, but I just wonder how much it, it just literally is that uh, Cardi B is a kind of viable left-wing spokesperson, or at least left of centre. I just want to go now to mm -hmm. to her speaking about um, uh, about um, Sanders in April. If I can find this. Yeah, I'm I'm really upset at everybody because, as you guys know. Bernie, and you know, he dropped out of the race. I'm guessing he dropped out because I'm seeing, he probably saw that he didn't had a good chance at winning. And the shit that get me mad about it is that it's like, I see a lot of young people, cause I see, girl, my forehead. I see a lot of young people on the internet always lying. Y'all motherfuckers, y'all young motherfuckers, I'm getting sick of y'all. Like I'm getting sick of y'all. I'm, I'm about to start hanging out with my grandma's friends because they vote. Y'all motherfuckers don't vote. And that shit is getting me tight. You wanna know motherfucking why? Because y'all be like, we love Bernie. I be seeing all over Twitter like, y'all love Bernie, y'all love Bernie. But y'all wasn't voting. Y'all wasn't voting. Okay, so I might also go and hang out with Cardi B's grandma or grandma's <laughs> friends because I think they'd probably be quite fun uh, and also they vote. But um, 
I mean, she has a kind of way of speaking and, and, and perhaps more inspiring than a lot of politicians. And it's not just a celeb sounding off, it's a celeb who, you know, is really trying to say something. Um, so, yeah, I think she's going to continue to be a target. Okay, so, I mean, yeah, that was somehow, at least, you know, a, a, as a kind of delivery, that was more inspiring than Biden's um, Democratic Convention speech the other day. So I'm just going to pull up a section from Biden. As president, I'll make you a promise. I'll protect America. I will defend us from every attack, seen and unseen, always, without exception, every time. Look, I understand. I understand how hard it is to have any hope right now. On this summer night, let me take a moment to speak to those of you who have lost the most. I have some idea how it feels to lose someone you love. I know that deep black hole that opens up in the middle of your chest and you feel like you're being sucked into it. I know how mean and cruel and unfair life can be sometimes. Okay, so not much particularly humorous in that, but, you know, on the other hand, uh, kind of bizarre. He sounds kind of like Clint Eastwood giving some kind of long uh, meandering speech during one of his Western films. But how does that strike you as American voters? It, you know, that, that Biden clip, um, I feel like it's rolling in this, you know, the personal tragedy that he had experienced with his son. And then there's, it's not explicitly stated, but I always think of this talking point that Steve Bannon brings up all the time, which is that the single greatest indicator of whether a, I forget if it's a household or a county voted for Trump, the single greatest indicator is if they had a family member who died in uh, either Iraq or Afghanistan. And so I wonder what is the implicit message with this quote of um, <clears throat> protecting us from attacks that are seen and unseen. Um, I, it, it's, it, it's very indeterminate to me. A lot of this Democrat stuff is, I don't know, it, it, it kind of feels like a, now I'm stuck on this Western metaphor because I, I feel like it's the fronts of the houses that are propped up in the Western <laughs> movie. Like this is the Democrat constituency and actually there's, there's nothing behind it. Like there's actually no one there. It's just the cardboard cutouts of, of an audience. Um, yeah, Cardi B is like way more inspiring. Like there's, there's some, you know, actual passion behind her words. Uh, it's hard to argue with that. Young people are just simply not turning out to vote. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not allergic to celebrity endorsements. There is also, you know, there is potentially a hazard in here where celebrities are not always the most politically educated people. So, uh, you, you can enlist them in, in different, um, uh, for different causes that may do more harm than good at some points. Um, <clears throat> I, I do think though, you're probably onto something that the Cardi B attack from Ben Shapiro is in many ways politically motivated. It's not just that she's a big star. It's probably she's more of a target because she came out uh, in support of Bernie rather than, I don't know, wh whoever else during the, the primary process. I think that's a, that's a good point. Right. Well, yeah. You know, so I listening to that Biden quote, though, it really makes me like envision this whole future of like nihilist Biden memes and maybe embracing that um, almost in a way where we had like the Antifa Jeb Bush memes, um, but more <laughs> self-aware and more self-accepting, like, you know, like a deep fried image of Biden with, I know what it feels like to have a hole in my chest. Um, you know, like these dark visions of just barely scratching hope, um, you know, just like, because that's, yeah, that's what he's radiating. And what Cardi B is giving is a lot more. Um, and it's a lot more fun to get along with. Um, her video that also went, um, that uh, Tucker Carlson played to prove that she was a bad person was her talking about how women need to take care of their bodies. I mean, she says it in, sure, like a crass way, but whatever. Um, she's talks it about, you know, you're you're going to eat a cheeseburger and then suck your man's dick and then let him put his dick inside you. And you think your shit's not going to get all fucked up. You got to take care of yourself. Like 
yeah, that's good advice. Um, you know, brush your teeth between uh, cheeseburger and dick sucking or anything like that. You know, like that's that's an empowerment that she's really getting at there. Um, and did, did, did you see, Josh, the uh, the Biden and the Cardi B interview? Like what she talks about <laughs> is all stuff that Biden does not stand for. And I don't know. To me, he looks so out of touch in it. And of one, course one, he does. One thing but... there is that he, he just kept saying he did stand for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did like say saying, that. Uh, free tuition fees. Um, I don't know what you what you call them. Medicare for all. These things. He actually, some things he actually opposed, and he's like, "Yeah, we'll, we'll do all that if I if I got that." Yeah, right. she was listing Bernie's Bernie's yeah. platform, basically. Extremely blackpilling. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, there's you know the meme where it's like, um, "Babe, it's four p.m. Time for." whatever whatever like he, he just looks so old and decrepit and we were watching this uh on the twitch stream and i just kind of pulled them up side by side and then in the in the chat in, in discord later like we all pieced together the screenshots to make the meme but i mean there were some parts of that interview which were really good there were some parts of it where it's like oh okay this is clearly a celebrity talking to a politician and there's some things that she kind of you know, didn't exactly stick the landing on where maybe you would have been able to to skewer Biden and hold him accountable for something. I mean, the language stuff is really slippery because basically, I mean, Bernie has been so successful in moving the conversation that now everybody has to be in some way in favor of Medicare for all, even though they're like completely, you know, against it, trying to actively dismantle a single payer program, but they at least have to name their counterattack under the popular policy. I guess that's the, not even mm -hmm. really an accomplishment, it's not really a victory here. Um, I don't know. I think, uh, I, I, I think it's, uh, I'm just, I'm so blackpilled on, on, on Biden right now. Uh, you know, four days of DNC streaming is, um, yeah, I, I think there's a hazard in, you know, a little bit of an adjacent topic, but as Adam mentioned before, memes that would be, uh, I guess, like a nihilistic acceptance of Biden. I guess what we've kind of seen is that there's no depth of depravity and irony on the internet that will not be unironically adopted by someone. So I just, I wonder, you know, I haven't figured it out fully myself, but I wonder about the efficacy of that because we may end up inadvertently propagandizing for just the mainstream of the Democratic Party, <clears throat> and in a way, just laundering those things by passively accepting it. You know, I'm, I don't know. I'm feeling pretty thorny and antagonistic towards the. Uh, yeah, the Biden I think I think you've got a very good point. I think if you had like a Duma Biden, it would get taken on very quickly by Dumas because the, you know, imagine the I imagine imagine I imagine that doomers are at this point going like, oh fuck, you know, we, we've got no choice but to vote for Biden because doomer mentality or nihilistic one is precisely, oh shit, we have no choice but to carry on living under these shitty conditions, whatever they be. Um, so yeah, I think it, it would become like a, almost a badge of honor. Um, but you know, then what's the difference between that and any other kind of form of, oh, we have to vote Biden anyway? which is basically where everyone is, except for those people who just pretend there's actually some other option, as in we're going to like push for a genuine communist uh, solution and not vote. That isn't really an option, I don't think. I mean, you can vote and that only takes five minutes where you may have to queue for an hour or two if you're really unlucky. And in the meantime, whilst you're not voting and all the time after you voted, you can try and form a viable communist party or movement but you're still going to need to vote or else you end up with Trump again, which is, I think, just too dangerous to countenance. Yeah, I mean, you can do both. That's, that's true, yeah. Um, but yeah, regardless, I mean, I, I think actually, Adam, you should do, or we should do, or Josh, well, we could all have had a go. We should do this kind of Doom of Biden thing because I think it would be fun in a way. Um, well, and the other thing that got me in the Cardi B Biden interview, um, so like he seems really interrupty and stuff like that, like he's almost not there half time. But then when he starts talking about the civil rights movement, he shifts the tone to such a dark place out of nowhere. Um, 
that it was really jarring for me. Like, you know, we're listening to Cardi B um, in her funny voice, but saying some good stuff. And then all of a sudden, Joe Biden's like, and you're watching little black boys get their skins ripped off with uh, with hoses. And just like, what the fuck, Joe? That, like, that this was is, quite bizarre. Why are that's you bringing just, this up? But that's maybe his bizarre thing where, like, you know, you've had a few bizarre presidents that say random <laughs> shit, but his thing's just going to be like saying some really dark stuff all the time. I mean, all the time, as, as long as he lasts. He's not all there, right? He probably can't even control it. It just slips out saying insane shit all the time. But that is like one one part of um, dementia, isn't it? It's like saying inappropriate dark stuff. Um, yeah, you, you know what? I mean, <laughs> I I would be more tempted to make memes just just beating liberals over the head with this bite and shit of like, remember they spent four years making fun of Trump talking like a goddamn idiot. <laughs> and now this is their dude, you know? So what I, I would prefer is like, okay, if someone feels a, a moral obligation in terms of harm reduction to vote for Joe Biden, I would prefer that they do it quietly <laughs> and that the memes they make are just excruciate. Like everyone who unironically supports Joe Biden should be made, made very painfully aware that they are in a deeply hypocritical position because we have the receipts for four years now. <laughs> it's, it's really, I mean, it's like the, the bait and switch here is something that's the thing that's most black feeling about it is that like, even if we are able to set the narrative it's not clear that that is even, you know, making uh, making significant progress, right? Because we changed the national conversation, but now Bernie's policies are the names of the opposite policies. It's uh, it's a very depressing moment. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, it doesn't look good uh, from here in Europe, honestly. Um, I suppose I'm kind of fortunate I'm in Finland. I'm not even in the UK, I know I'm British. So I kind of look at, I look at Britain, you know, as kind of a, a, as bad as, as bad as America. Um, so I kind, of, I kind of feel for you there, but like thinking through it from like an outsider's point of view and, and what, you know, also because I get in a position of having to talk about this stuff a lot, even if I'm not going to vote, it, it doesn't look uh, good in any sense. You know, there was always a thing of like, who is he going to choose as his running mate and that might be some relief because he's probably not going to do a second term. And at one point he was talking about not doing much of the first term. And then he chooses um, Kamala Harris. We're just going to listen to a bit of her speech here. And we can just see if she's, she could be a potential uh, meme figure, memeable figure. She taught us to put family first, the family you're born into and the family you choose. Family is my husband, Doug, who I met on a blind date set up by my best friend. Family is our beautiful children, Cole and Ella, who call me Mamala. Family is my sister. Family is my best friend, my nieces, and my godchildren. Family is my uncles, my aunts, and my chitties. Family is Mrs. Shelton, my second mother who lived two doors down and helped raise me. Family is my beloved Alpha Kappa Alpha, our divine nine, and my HBCU brothers and sisters. Okay, so I, I have to ask and what, what the hell is she on about half the time? I mean, it's like a coded language. I, I guess she was talking about her university at the end or something. Um, at one yeah. point she says... Uh, or what is the... Uh, Sounds the like NCU Greek letters, right? or something. I don't know if it, it, so. I presume it's a uni. The, the U at the end could be university. H HBCU is a historically black college. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Well, that's something, I suppose. Uh, but then at some point she says her chitties. What was it? Yeah, I don't. I don't. I'm not familiar with that term. Um, it might be a. It might be a Jamaican or an Indian um, term. I'm not sure. But what was up with her voice during it? She yeah. started talking like a valley girl or something. I thought it looked very acted. She, it just, she didn't look really very real uh, at all. Uh, Chitties is the uh, Tamil word for ants. So, I mean, she's speaking across various uh, coalitions, right? She's trying to, right. trying to tap each of the, each of the groups that, that might fall in to support her. The family yeah. stuff is a little... 
it's always interesting when the, the Democrats kind of make that pivot, you know what I mean? That they're uh, like, they lean into the family value stuff. I've been kind of, I've been thinking, I don't know, maybe this is like a, a different, a, a different world. Maybe this timeline is not possible, but like, you know, is there the possibility for like the prude family values left? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, is there, uh, is there some possibility in the next few years of like, um, I don't know, people who are like socially conservative, who are um, maybe a little embarrassed by hearing <laughs> the lyrics really slowly spelled out without music to, to uh, wet ass pussy. And, um, you know, really do like the family value stuff. Maybe they go to church, you know, is, is that a, is that a coalition? I don't know. Maybe the right branding on social media could make it happen. But there is, there is trad girl, but I guess trad girl is, is, um, a right wing thing, I suppose the, the, the meme girl, um, traditional values girl. I mean, I, I see her come up in a lot of left wing memes, but I suppose the whole point is she's supposed to be a woman associated or, or is it like more like anarcho-ecology? Um, what's going on with trad girl? Yeah. I mean, it's, um, when you really chase the rabbit hole, it brings you into, uh, stuff on the far right, which is about, um, you know, traditionalism and uh, a woman's role as uh, someone who takes care of the household, who has children, and then this is very quickly segued into, um, you know, replacement theory and, and this kind of stuff. Uh, but I, I just I just wonder in this in the way that social media carves out the, these antagonistic positions that are maybe a product of the social media landscape more so than they are ideologically consistent. Um, is maybe one way to uh, put the brakes on the democratic rhetoric of kind of relentless lip service to progressivism while no material while making no material commitment whatsoever is one of those things to just take this really uh, contrarian position and say you know like well what if there is a coalition that wants family values what if there is a coalition that I, I jokingly call this the prude left but maybe that can be a countervailing force to kind of swing swing it back in the other direction um but you, do, but you see that as, as, as swinging it towards a materialist or socialist position rather than a, an identitarian position well that is that's the um that's the gambit um, the, the gamble, sorry, right, is that um, are you in, in what politicization funnel is the demographic you're talking about? Are they on their way to the left or are they on their way to the right? And at certain points, especially in these young corners of social media, that stuff is very indeterminate. But I have to, I have to question, um, it just really doesn't seem when every major company is completely on board with all of the progressive aspects of the Democratic Party, um, those things are not really feeling like they are a threat to capital. And I realize this is a very, very new position. Like this is a phenomena that has only really occurred in the last decade. But um, in our process of floundering and, and grasping for, uh, for any point of leverage as we are just sucked down this endless, like, that monster in Star Wars where they dump the guys into and it just digests you over a thousand years. Like that is the economic prospects of Gen Z people in the U.S. under, you know, certainly the Republicans, but also under the Democratic Party. Um, you know, potentially those things can be antagonisms that, that force people to, they serve as a wedge and they make you come out on one side or the other. But when you, when you mention Star Wars, that is like the family you choose. But Kamala said, you know, the family you, you're you born into, the family you choose, you have like Luke and uh, Chewbacca and Han Solo, et cetera. Um, and the thing is with, with capitalism and, and with, with the data economy, with um, what we have now with smartphones and, and uh, social media, et cetera, is that we don't have so much the, either the family that we're born into or the family we choose. We're much more atomized. And that makes it very hard to organize as socialists. Um, so I think you have a point, uh, although I'm not sure it's the one you were making as such, but the point you make leads into, um, you know, if you can reunite families or make that important, you can actually maybe on some, on some levels combat capitalism more effectively. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, there, there is, 
you know, it, it's a little, little bit of an adjacent, uh, maybe this is a side quest of our, our real topics here, but, you know, of like the, the families being intact as a general social indicator of, of, of wealth is, is one thing to consider. I don't think there's, um, there's too much to really, to, to build that argument on. Um, but generally, I think of, um, I think back to Mark Fisher, and I think of the example that he offers of the generation of Goodfellas versus the generation of Heat. And for me, you know, hearing this idea of the family that you choose, it sounds, it sounds almost like, I don't know, people that you um, have friendships with because you share a similar workplace, or they are in some ways these, these transactional relationships that um, really revolve around labor, around the extraction of surplus value, around work. And yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean... Um, it's, it's funny because it's one of these thorny positions that you kind of sound like a reactionary while, while you're talking about it. But I guess the, the thing that I'm trying to tease out here is this, this relentless celebration of capital deterritorializing all aspects of traditional society is, you know, in the communist utopia, we will have that full emancipation, full liberation. But to some degree, the way that this is being done now is really only in the service of, of capital. And the end result of that is that you get people who really have maybe one or two friends in their, in their IRL life. Like they just live in their apartment, they go to work, they work 12 hours a day, and then they have to do something like Zog Sports. Do you know this? I don't think it's around anymore, but it was like one of these apps where you, you sign up to like play soccer or Frisbee uh, you know, once a week after, after work. And it's just, our society has become so atomized in this process that um, we've literally introduced marketplaces in between so all of our social relationships and, and our friendships even. Uh, and, you know, those like, I guess that's the breaks. That's what I'm trying to elucidate here is that, um, you know, we, we shouldn't be just like we shouldn't be bullied into voting for, for Joe Biden, um, we shouldn't be tricked into celebrating uh, capital, replacing uh, the, the, the old society, even if we dislike the old society. Is that, it, does that kind of make sense? I know it's, it's, it's a real ideological it, tightrope, but I think that's what Fisher is, is so important for elucidating. Well, it does. It does make sense. And it's, um, it, it's that move... Um, to post Fordist, you know, and digital mm -hmm. technology. You see that with right. um, the gig economy and stuff, exactly. like the way we celebrate being able to work on your own time, make your own schedule. You get to be in your own car all day instead of a stuffy office, um, which sound like good things, yet they have such negative consequences. Or with uh, the with Corona and the Zoomification of work, we have people that are actually working more than when they were working their office jobs. Um, exactly. You know, they're constantly in contact and yeah, it's kind of a nightmare. Um, however much they like not having to go into the office. Cause I know people that are doing it and yeah, they, they both enjoy not having to go into the office, but yeah, they're working more and they're and that work, that pressure also comes internally. It's not just like their boss is demanding them to work. Um, you know, they wake up and they're like, oh, well, I'm going to check my text messages. Oh, look, I got this work thing. I, I guess I could log on while I'm having my coffee and do some stuff. And then the whole day's gone and they've worked the whole day rather than going in and having that set time, the separation of work and life um, is kind of disappearing. And that's, that's the scary thing. We don't want that. Um, but we do want that, you know, but it's happening in the negative way. Like you were saying, it's uh, serving mm -hmm. capital. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, eventually you, you do, you do want that, but you want to do it through abolishing work rather than right, <laughs> in this right. case, abolishing life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so where everything is a work transaction, um, yeah, that's a sad, sad future and a sad present. I mean, it's, it's contradictory that you know you have these platforms like like Twitch and Patreon, Patreon, which allow you to grow your own community and, and potentially make money from it. And and Joshua is doing doing great things on Twitch. We're going to restart our Twitch activity soon with with the acid left, where we also have a Patreon. 
uh, like Joshua does. And Joshua's like just super at all this stuff and way ahead of us. Um, but Joshua, I mean, do you find, you know, Twitch kind of taking over your life at points? Because, you, you know, there are these people you really feel they've been freed up, they've been made stars where they wouldn't probably have got an opportunity, uh, like Amaranth uh, being one, a lot of the, the female streamers um, who wouldn't have been famous 10 years ago. Um, but then you think, you just look at them sometimes, you think they look so tired, at, you know, at points. And then, <laughs> and then you know, about being tired, um, you had Amaranth actually sleeping, um, deliberately doing a whole stream sleeping, not the first person. I think the first one, one to do it was a guy. But there have been a few streamers who streamed themselves sleeping and made money during that. But you see them almost being the pioneers of us losing the right to be un un uninterrupted by capital during our sleep. Um, so, yeah, kind of very liberating, but also worrying. But how do you kind of deal with your your kind of free time and stuff as a Twitch streamer? Yeah, yeah. Well, this is... Um... A, a lot of issues bundled in together here. Um, I think you're bringing up some really good, really good points. I, I feel like um, my time in the art world was in large part trying, or at least our role in the discourse, myself and a, a few other artists that came up along a similar time who were very, you know, for the art world standards, well versed in social media comparatively, and that the art world has been extremely slow to adopt these things. Um, a lot of what we did or our function in the discourse was to disentangle, um, disentangle the story that Silicon Valley told about itself, that Twitter had a claim to some kind of revolutionary project that the Arab Spring could not have happened without us. We are putting people in touch with each other. This is in and of itself a good thing. And once everyone is given a voice, then true democracy will happen. The revolution is sure to follow something, something like that. That was the general story that was, that was uh, offered or that they told about themselves. And instead what, what we tried to counter this with was that, you know, the existing society and it's old, you know, conservative stodgy institutions. These guys are, these guys are really bad. We don't like them, but <laughs> What is, what is happening is that these institutions are going to be infiltrated, hollowed out from inside and replaced by these platforms. And the platforms are actually going to be worse than the old stodgy conservative institutions because at least the old institutions stood for something. At least they had, had beliefs, whereas the, the new emerging billionaire class, I mean, quite literally a billionaire class that has emerged in the last decade attached to these, these platforms and the like, um, the only thing that really steers them is this pursuit of profit, this optimization, this, um, you know, a, a kind of uh, a, an atomization of, of neoliberal uh, subjects of giving you your individual little profile and your platform so that you can be this bootstrapping entrepreneur. Um, that that reality is in some ways uh, darker and, and more dangerous, um, which... You know, I, I kind of think that, that that narrative has has actually tracked. Uh, we are we are kind of there now, um, but so you're 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 given this um, again a tightrope to walk, I guess, which is that you know my vision of the socialist utopia. I, I, I've always said this on, on on Twitch and a few other places, but I'll just I'll reiterate here. Uh, my vision of the oh sorry. Um, my, my vision of the socialist utopia involves strong, well-funded, big institutions that serve the public interest. I, I've always maintained that. Um, I'm a reformist, I'm not a revolutionary or, or anything like that. Um, and I'm hopeful that what these crowdfunding sites, like what Patreon and what social media can do is to be a life raft from from the Titanic, <laughs> from, from these sinking ships, the, these crumbling institutions, uh, but that they can, uh, the, eventually their plan is to redock with the mothership in that if we uncritically embrace this Patreon thing, this crowdfunding thing, we are just going to embolden the, the, the Peter Thiels of the world who are literally planning on, 
climate collapse, global apocalypse, to the degree that they have bunkers <laughs> set up. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, those guys are maybe worse rulers. That is a worse ruling class than the Kennedys or the 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 older um, the older figures of power. So, uh, yeah, I guess it's that it is that cart in front of the horse. Uh, you know. Uh, whatever the uh, how the IWW used to say, the planting the seed of the new society in the shell of the old. It is that that impossible task that you have to some way figure out an escape trajectory from the current course you're on using the tools that you presently have. Uh, and so, you know, we shouldn't be maybe Amaranth as, as an example of like what Patreon and Twitch can very easily be used for is as you're describing, just this total atomization. You should be earning and monetizing every moment of your life, even when you're asleep. Like that is the farthest, furthest calibration of a bad way of these things working out. And maybe a good way of them working out is that they create the messaging, they create the content that politically educates people that sends them down this politicization funnel. And at the end of that is this new reconstituted Marxian left that is the, you know, pie in the sky end goal of, of all of this stuff against all odds. I hope that we can build that. Um, yeah, but it is, uh, you know, you kind of, you can't really let your guard down at all. It's a, uh, it's a constant struggle between, between these two, uh, uh or these various uh, directions you're being pulled. I mean, yeah. We're headed to the point where if, um, you know, if you want to make in some extra bucks, you can rent your dreams out to be advertisements uh, through the neural link. <laughs> that, I think exactly. That, exactly. I think we should ask, or someone should ask Joe Biden what he thinks. And then, then we get like the worst case scenario, the real kind of doom scenario. And, and we'd know how bad it could get. And we could then kind of work back from there. Mm, um, yeah. But, but um, I mean, the thing is, you, it's easy to imagine the worst case scenario. And it's kind of what, theorists do and, and people who theorize and artists and and i guess we're theorizing at the moment um i mean i don't know what amaranth thinks about the fact that she made money while she was sleeping and she's not maybe condoning that we all do it all the time so um you know there, there are these as you're saying there are, there are these two different two different paths and it depends how we kind of uh how we move forward with this tech that that enables us to do great things, but also obviously is to some extent restrictive and potentially heralds new forms of domination, which are more sinister even than old ones. And it also makes the old power forms get more and more ludicrous, you know. So we get Biden acting like he is Trump being president when he shouldn't be. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, it's all how we play it, but. I'm just worried that we're not playing it very well and no one really knows. I mean, I've got a lot of smart friends. Um, I've been speaking to you guys for a year or so. I don't know. I guess that's about right. Um, I, I did a, po a podcast with uh, Danny Badman Massive, uh, who works with Zero, who's also doing some political campaigning work. He has a new company, very smart, but he didn't really know what's going on either or how, or how we should approach this. So, you know, I'm kind of worried about our, our lack of ideas. And then that's when you get the leader of the Democrats uh, or the, the candidates stand up and just sort of say we're all doomed or just, you know, give some negative spiel. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm not being very much more helpful myself here, but I mean, <laughs> uh, Adam, help me. So, so well, all right, Josh, so you say that you're an admitted reformist, right? Um mm. What do you think? Because I this is something I've been thinking over the last uh, probably since like 2015, but it always feels like there's something wrong with it. But I can't figure out why uh, I think that um, a massive voter reform movement in the U.S. that could even operate bipartisan. Um, of course, like the, the Republican Party and probably even the Democratic Party wouldn't want this kind of thing. Um, but I think the voters think they want it um, and it would be best. So I'm talking about something like uh, 
campaign finance reform, with universal voter registration, maybe even paid voting holidays, uh, instant runoff voting, maybe lowering the voting age, um, like all of that at once and getting rid of the way voting in America actually works. And I think with something like that, or maybe that's my hope is with such a massive change like that, um, that you really could break out of the established parties that we have and open up new possibilities um, for more serious reform. Um, I'm just going to jump. I'm just going to jump in there, Adam, because we have we, we're quite limited. But would you frame this as basically a question to to Joshua of what the hell we do next? Yeah, I guess so. Um, yeah, if we're go if we're thinking about operating within these frameworks, like what about shifting the that frame of voting itself and how it could work? Hmm. hmm. Joshua, if you you have like a a couple of minutes, if you can like uh, do that in that time. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not sure if I have a specific proposal on that front, uh, on that specific front. I mean, generally, my fear is I think similar to what I laid out before that. Uh, many times when we tear down the existing institutions, under the current conditions, they are replaced with things that are much worse. So uh, one might imagine a dystopian scenario where, um, you know, post-COVID, all voting machines are now abolished. We live in a viral world. We can never allow people to gather ever again. Um, and being voting being done by mail, for some reason or another, doesn't work out. So what is then introduced is that... Um, the government hires a private company to create uh, blockchain voting or, or something like that. And everyone has to, uh, you know, be on this app or whatever that works through your smartphone or whatever. And it's just, it is not thoroughly considered in how all of that infrastructure works. And so what you end up in is that only people who can afford a thousand dollar smartphone are the ones who can vote and you know i'm just kind of spitting out a speculative uh, terrible dystopian example well but, what um, if what if we um what if we gave everyone microchips under their skin that would allow them to vote <laughs> uh yeah hey that's uh maybe maybe that is the future that's going to happen anyway right yeah but that's what we need we need elon musk to to kind of help us out on that one he always has the kind of good ideas no <laughs> yeah. but um, but um, we're going to have to wrap up uh, around now. That's kind of a shame. I mean, it's, it gone, it's gone so quickly and we covered so many great things, but we could have covered so much more. And of course, Joshua Cittarella, as I said in the introduction, is a visual artist, aside from being a brilliant meme maker and commentator on meme culture and culture generally. So uh, do check out his work. We will leave a link to his website and to his Twitch. And we hope he'll come back soon. Um, I mean, what else can we say? Uh, any kind of concluding, concluding comments um, as to where we go? I mean, I'm going to say I'm not American. I'm not going to vote. But I think that it's quite clear that voting bidden is the is the way forward, and and that makes me just feel really sad. So um, I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. We appreciate your empathy. Uh, I'm going to do a, a fully fleshed out position on the next podcast. And I think it, it varies based on where you are. That would be my, my answer, my short answer. Okay, brilliant. All right. Thanks very much, Joshua. Hope to see you, speak to you soon. And stay tuned. We'll be back soon with another guest and another episode.